education in your world, in K-12, really everywhere, um, from all these perspectives, have increased in our, you know, from our discussions, the need for understanding about um, typically what, I mean, from our, from our world, we look at experiences, right? Like, where are there gaps? Where do you, where does somebody need something? Where do they need access, technology, people, content, learning? And it's not, they're not able to get it. Like what you think you're able to provide to them isn't what they're able to consume. And that can be because, uh, you know, the internet's not good. The program's not working. I didn't know how to sign up for something. I now have to work remote in a way I didn't before, or I've never had to use Zoom in the way that I had to now. We've even had those challenges come up. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your organization thought about taking uh, what were already a lot of places you could listen and building in uh, something that was digestible, right? The way in which you could at a larger scale begin to, through this crazy disruption, just start to get your hands around not only the personal, the areas where you could make a difference for the person, but the, area, the ways in which you could understand how the organization needed to kind of pivot as a whole to adapt to the new environment. Sure, and I think it was, um, I, I think it was difficult in the moment um, to try and envision any um, grand data collection exercise where this would have been, you know, a, a, an easy pathway because our organization is um, decentralized in a lot of ways that many educational organizations are, and and nothing um, can be straightforward most of the time, but. Um, what we ended up doing uh, very early on in COVID was that there was the, the creation of a task force just focused around communicating. Um, because I, I think we recognized early on that this was going to be a very different lift than the way that we were used to communicating organizationally. And so that ended up being a group of um, what I want to call tactical managers. Um, I, you know, I represented the IT organization. Um, HR was there, communications was there, um, various mission administrators were there, and that group was meeting uh, daily for the first couple of months of COVID. And it was, it was a very useful cycle to take feedback that was coming up organically around the organization um, and all the channels that it, it comes in during a messy crisis like COVID was, and to be able to rapidly figure out what needs addressing, what should we do, and what can we do quickly um, to address it? Because I think what, what you said about those challenges, you know, uh, people not being used to Zoom or having poor internet at home or ha having to worry about childcare, it, it all ultimately comes down to their personal um, engagement and drive at that, that point in time. And anybody who is worried about a family member or, um, you know, not sure how they're going to be able to work with two kids running around in the background during the course of a the day. They're not necessarily going to be able to give you their best unless you support them. And so hearing that feedback coming up and, you know, it was a lot of channels, but at least having one place to route it to, to help reach out, figure out what a solution might be, whichever arm of the organization needs to address that, that particular issue, and then make sure that it's being communicated clearly, consistently, and in a, a way that people can digest it, you know, multi-channel was very big for us um, and trying to make sure that we've ha we had faculty members who were, you know, seeing patients 12 hours a day and they don't have time to go read an email or watch a video necessarily, but, you know, maybe we need to print a poster up and slap them around some of the locations just to make sure that they can see it and internalize it. Um, so it, it was a lot of triaging through a shared structure that I think worked out very well for us. Yeah, it, it's interesting how, and, and you've both talked to me about this, that you having this digital open door in, in different areas of your work allowed you to learn things that maybe weren't on your priority list. Like you start thinking about uh, how to solve the challenges in front of you. But Dan, you spoke about this yesterday. Um, there's a hierarchy of needs sometimes, right? You can't, I, I can't learn effectively. I can't, I can't teach effectively if I can't get transportation from A to B, right? If I'm worried about childcare and having this open door mentality, the ability to, to, to people to give you feedback and, and to talk about how their lives have been disrupted gives you the, the awareness of the experience beyond, 
even those factors that the task force knows to ask about, which I think has been is pretty powerful. I, I think your organization talked about the renewal challenge, you know, uh, that was the, the, the verbiage you use. And um, this is out on related back to the work Johan's doing, but would you mind talking a little bit about the renewal challenge and, and how you guys thought about that? Sure. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we didn't really get a chance to stop. So it was not that we um, started looking at this through the framework of, okay, we're, you know, we have no momentum or we're going to start building it up again. We were, we were sort of going in one direction and it was just the roads changing. Mm -hmm. How do we drive better uh, to make that a, a really quick analogy. So um, the word renewal ended up getting attached to most of these efforts and um, that transition happened to, for us uh, of thinking very seamlessly, I want to say in mid-May, um, where it was, okay, what does this look like for our educational programs for the fall? Because, and even uh, the fall was actually probably a little bit uh, misguided because we have some educational programs that start at the beginning of July mm -hmm. and our graduation is the end of May. So that, that time frame is almost non-existent um, for transitioning for having to change as part of the, the semester transition. So um, our renewal activity, you know, we, I don't think the task force had much intention to um, help craft those renewal plans. It's not our place necessarily to tell any of these missions how they, um, they should operate. But I think what we were able to do was to bring in, to, to offload the need to communicate them out. Um, it, it's one thing to have to even write these in the first place, but to make them digestible and get them out to people and make sure that um, it's there as a resource was, was something that we took on and I think we did a good job at. And as it, uh, one of the things that I was happy to see was that the renewal plans became part of the story to address um, those personal anxieties. You know, a, a staff member who is being asked to come back into the office is gonna worry about are they going to give me PPE? Um, what, what does this look like for my commute? A laundry list of questions. And to have the plans addressing those points and um, to be able to show them, because very few people at, at Weill have one role or they're only focused on one mission. We, everybody tends to span multiple. Um, to be able to, to look and say, oh, this is what we're doing for clinical care. I feel, I feel good about that. And you know, I'm not. I'm not going to be maybe so worried that when I walk into a building, I'm going to run into a patient because we have this plan. Even if I'm not seeing patients as part of my work, um, that all became very important as uh, communicating down. And you know, that that same as concerns rose, and and maybe these plans tweak a little bit, or we clarify the details and make sure um, what we're hearing is getting addressed. Yeah, it's interesting that both of your communities weren't, were not able to face the challenge. I know that there's a typical challenge in higher education, but you, as you said, Dan, you weren't able to stop. Um, it, you had to graduate students early to send them in the field of, to actually start working in the pandemic. They had the option to do that, right? Which is an incredibly uh, different shift from where normal war was. And, and Johan, you, we spoke yesterday about the fact that um, you were setting up schools for lost uh, rooms, physical rooms for law students, that, and you had considerations and you needed to manage. Uh, somebody in the chat brought up a question around the Zoom lawsuits. I, I remember you mentioning something like, how are you getting permission to be, you know, videoed in a room for those that are in the room? And, and even that, like, even once you get the, the logistics figured out, there are so many process changes, so many new uh, you know, kind of like barriers you have to overcome just to facilitate it. And that's often a technological problem as much as it is like a legal issue. Like you were talking about how, do, how am I going to get everybody to sign off on the fact that their lectures may be recorded? And, and it's like, you have a bunch of check boxes you need to check in order to just facilitate this new type of learning. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, and there are so many dependencies um, and things that when we're, we're problem solving, that it's kind of like you, you, you solve one, but then you, you identify that there are five underlying 
uh, requirements just to accomplish that 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 one point and in the classroom the return to classroom is a great point or even even when we're fully remote and as you mentioned is there a, a legal ramification for requiring students to enable their video is that an invasion of privacy um, what about recordings um, not only in the legal field but I'm sure in the medical field as well if you you know you have an attorney client, client privilege I'm sure if you have consultations on the medical field obviously if those things are being captured somewhere, there is a concern, especially with the security. Early on, there were issues with things like Zoom bombing. Um, while you know the technologies tried to catch up with this massive influx of people and, and, and attention, so all of these these risks, um, probably good good to call them risks, um, really uh, blossomed. Um, and having to to, to navigate that. Um, and to Dan's point, set the expectations, um, communicate that effectively. How do you communicate that, that, those, you know, those concerns at a wide enough net, as it were, that is, it's a simple message everyone can understand, taking into account that stakeholders at different levels have different priorities, right? Students obviously have different concerns. Parents of students have different concerns. Uh, you know, how do you functionally get people back into a room, socially distanced? Um, you know, even before you get inside the classroom, how do you let people through the doorway? Elevators, stairways, access points, taking into account, you know, fire codes. Uh, you know, all of these things just start uh, mounting up. So you really need um, really good management. Um, you really need good planning um, to be able to look at not only the macro level, what are we trying to accomplish? What's the goal? But who are the people? Who are the people that really need to facilitate and implement all this? What are their requirements? What do they need to, to do this? Um, so, you know, as we started talking initially, there's a ton of data points there. Um, and I think in terms of higher education, um, I was having a conversation with a colleague the other day. Un unlike you might say, maybe a larger corporation, which has, let's say, a disaster recovery plan, a building burns down. You know, I don't think as an industry, higher education, we didn't have a disaster recovery plan yeah. for the entire country shutting down. Um, and so a lot of things are being written as we go. Um, and, but it's a fluid situation. So, you know, they change as state uh, policies and regulations, federal regulations, um, you know, change. We, or we are constantly having to update this documentation in our knowledge base to, to meet those challenges. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, I want I have one more question, then I would like to spend the last 15 minutes or so uh, allowing you to take uh, questions from the audience, or I'm happy to fill in as well. But this disruption, it's been so interesting, the multiple stakeholders, one that's been really common, and it just, just highlights the issue is like, um, where you are having people come back to campus, we're doing like uh, attestations, hey, do you have any symptoms? Are you coming into the building? And there's so, so much there for students and for faculty and for staff. I mean, the, the stakeholders that have that need to be a part of this communication you have the, the tech team you have the students you have the health team you have facilities that are playing a role in this you're coordinating with county and city uh, if you're doing contact tracing efforts there are so i mean that's one that a lot of people are dealing with but that highlights just uh, how many experiences are being shifted or disrupted uh, in, in ways that we're seeing at least the fear to your point uh, be a disaster for higher ed to where there's, should I go back to school this fall? You see a lot of, a lot of higher ed going, what's the enrollment impact going to be? Are kids going to come back? Are they going to take a gap year? Do they have trust in our organization? And solving those really complex programs with so many stakeholders, typically around trust and health is, uh, has become kind of the forefront of how institutions are kind of engaging from a communication standpoint with a lot of their students. Yeah, and, and to the point, you know, I've, I've talked with colleagues, you know, all up and down the, you know, the East Coast, even West Coast, and we're all facing the similar challenges. I think in New York City, you know, especially uh, given that, you know, most higher education or education in general, we, we're not on a closed campus. We're not in some small town. Uh, you know, we can control this, con you know, the contact, the, the, the social distancing within our, our buildings. But yeah. students who are in housing, which is an apartment on another block, uh, those, you know, workers who have to take the subway every day. Uh, how do you account for all of these touch points? Uh, it makes things like contact tracing, you know, a, a phenomenal um, undertaking so that, you know, we have these layers of, 
of checks uh, quarantining if you're coming from overseas. You know, we have students who are stuck overseas because of visa issues and then having to quarantine for two weeks before they're even allowed to get on campus. Daily checks, uh, temperature checks at every door, limiting access ways. Um, so all of these measures, you know, we're trying to put a best effort, um, obviously, and, and be mindful of how we can control um, and limit exposure. Uh, you know, but as you mentioned, it, it, it's, it's difficult, especially in an urban setting. Um, New York is just, it, it is difficult. Yeah, CUNY expressed that exact concern as well, whether they're distributed across the city. They said, look, how do we, how do, we do that with our students where, like, it's not a closed community. It's not like we put our arms around campus and separate people in the dorms and provide food to them. Like, they're in the city. Um, and I think New York City especially faces um, an elevation of that challenge. Not that other places don't, but it is, it's a very unique environment. Good. Well, we did have a couple of questions come in. I didn't, I, I can't pretend that I understand the, the, these too much, but Dan, did you, there's a question here on quantum computing and COVID IT data. Uh, any I'm not such sure new... I've got much of an understanding to answer that either. Um, I, I will say that, that we, we have done a, a large amount of work um, around COVID and, and data sets and everything else. Um, and we've got a lot of great success stories on our newsroom. So <laughs> visit our website, um, but nothing, nothing I can personally share. That's a little outside of my area. Yeah, there's, it's, it's, we are, because we are this human data company, we're used for research in a lot of higher ed institutions, as well as a lot of um, places doing primary research, where we have, we have really interesting conversations coming around, like how, where are we collecting data, whether it is qualitative symptoms, sometimes it's quantitative data filled in forms, Sometimes it is operational data that is related it, it, through research to try to understand where and how um, uh, COVID is spreading or whatever else. It's, it's it gonna be interesting to see how things like quantum computing mesh this operational uh, you know, quantitative data and this maybe human qualitative symptom, uh, you know, touchy feely data together to try to make a leap and a bound in this world of, of uh, pandemic tracking, tracing. Okay, there was another one here. This, sorry, this chat chain is a little strange. Oh, Yo Johan, um, uh, start licensed professions and continuing education field apprenticeships. Um, sure, actually, it's, it's, it's an interesting area. Um, I think as, you know, higher education's taken a hit to the bottom line, um, you know, uh, obviously enrollments, deferrals, loss of, of revenue from housing, um, you know, we're looking for how can we adapt our, our business model to accommodate a, a majority remote. Um, and speaking for the law school, being a graduate school, being a, a professional school, uh, there is great interest, obviously, uh, for doing things for uh, LLM programs, um, where obviously lawyers from around the country and, and, and around the world uh, still have a requirement to... Um, you know, maintain their, 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 their certifications and, and their education. Um, and funny enough, I, I think the COVID has, has uh, opened some new opportunities. Um, it has highlighted obviously a need in, in changing some of our, 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 our teaching styles and, and, and thankfully, you know, educated a, a large group of teachers how to teach remotely, uh, but also shown that you can facilitate uh, new programs, ed educational executive programs, uh, continuing education programs, and do that uh, effectively remotely, um, which the, the thought is it, it should continue, you know, after we all go back. Um, and, I, and I think that's one area we'll see growth uh, for sure is things, telemedicine, all these things that we've had to now implement be because we're all remote, but they have opened, let's say, uh, in terms of accessibility, access to these services, legal services, remote, uh, you know, consultations. I think this has been kind of a trial by fire to, to show that these models can work given the right uh, management and organization for it. Yeah, it's, it's, it is uh, one of the silver, you know, small silver linings in this, in this tragic pandemic is that it, it has taken industries that were slowly progressing towards disrupting modalities or technologies or ways in which you're delivering or measuring um, and just force them to move five years down to the field, right? 
Um, and you were talking yesterday about the bar, the, the, you know, taking the bar exam has very strict rules and the way in which you do it. Um, and you were being forced to adopt that even. And so there's going to be old organizations, whether it be medical certifications, legal, uh, you know, the bar exam uh, or anything else. I can imagine, you know, hold on guys, I got to zoom into court. <laughs> it may become a very different experience if people are FaceTiming into their courtroom. Well, they, had, they just had uh, announced the first criminal trial remote. Um, so there are, there are some things that we would, could have never imagined would, would be possible or even allowed, uh, but are, are now uh, very valid, <laughs> very valid. Depending on how crazy my kids are, I feel like I might be in remote prison a little bit, depending on how long you're in the Zoom room, just a little bit of torture. So maybe we'll start doing prison remote as well. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, any other questions? I want to go back over the thing and see if there's any questions for the group. It is, um, there's been a ton of work done in either of your organizations, just expanding the ways in which you're understanding what experiences matter, how to improve those experiences and how to do more with what you have now. You didn't have time to go reinvent the wheel. You had to take the tools before you and figure out new ways to do these, you know, crazy new challenges. And, you know, Qualtrics and our team has been lucky enough that you have, force that innovation upon our organization where we're seeing tons of new use cases where people are coming to us and saying, Hey, we really want to be able to go do this crazy new thing because now we got to put people in rooms and ways we've never had to before and, and this new challenge. So um, we want to thank you and the rest of our partners across higher ed and uh, K-12, not only in, uh, in the city and state of New York, but across the country for the work you're doing there. Well, maybe if I, if I could say, say to that one point, you know, we were also discussing, you know, typically when, when you, you know, send out a survey or a questionnaire, the response rate, you know, you get 10%, you're, you know, Killing it. You're, you're, you're doing, you know, yeah. jumping jacks. Um, if anything, um, you know, as we were talking about, we've seen response rates skyrocket mm -hmm. um, because these are some of the only um, communication channels that people have to be able to get their voice and their opinion um, and feel like their, their situation is being um, recorded um, and counted. So I think it's, you know, again, it's a great opportunity for us to take these changes in behavior and be able to gather the data. Um, so we are making um, decisions based on what's actually happening versus the, what we think is happening. Because I know, especially with the way media is this day, there's a lot of uh, distractions, if we might call that. Um, but we want to, when we get down to it, we want to make decisions which which are, are correct and, and yeah. which accurately reflect. There's this, we call it um, leading versus lagging data. So usually organizations are rich in operational data. Like I know when a transaction occurred, I know when a student logged into a, their online learning, I know when they registered for a class and that's the what happened data. It's the why data. You know, how are you feeling? What, what, you know, why did you do this? What is the leading the information that led you into that, that lets me understand and make decisions database decisions, not just on the operational ones and zeros of a transaction occurred, but taking into account the human experience side of why something happened and, and enhancing that culture of making decisions, not just on what you think, but what the data says with both of those pieces has been really powerful. And, and also, you know, to, to talk to, I know the, the panel before us was talking a lot about um, dealing with the social impacts and being able to capture um, you know, emotional intelligence, um, being able to look at those data points, which are not usually counted when you're looking at success metrics, uh, when you're looking at the social and, and the emotional impact that this has on all of us. Um, to be able to quantify that is very difficult. So when you have technologies, you know, that we've used, um, you know, such as Qualtrics, being able to help facilitate and give us a a visual, as you will, a map of how things are going and when we have such large, you know, communities communicating it is, is really essential. Yeah. I mean, you, you both, the, the, the industry of education is mission driven. I'm a first generation college student, so I had no idea how to do this thing. I actually failed out. So like I got into college, enough bad things happened and I was done. I was one of the statistics that didn't make it. Luckily enough, I let my wife, she was a teacher, she got me back in and I did make it, but that's not r very common. And I know what my life looked like before and during, and I'm very lucky for what it looks like now. It is uh, the difference you make in someone's life if you can 
create better experiences in that chain of, of this journey of higher education is so transformational, right? Not only to them, but it helps them be a promoter of higher education and, and want to bring their friends and family and their community and raise up um, everybody as a, um, into education as an institution. And it isn't just that you have people that are a really strong fanatic um, follower of Nike, you know, versus an okay follower. These are people whose lives are transformed and the outcomes of people having, you know, a string of good experiences as they're going through this is, is uh, incredibly impactful. The work, the work is, that's why I love to work with higher, higher ed and K-12 was, you know, because of the difference I can make. So yeah, great comment. Oh. Good. Well, um, we just about uh, are wrapping now. So uh, Dan, I wanted to thank you for your time and joining us. And Johan, I want to thank you for your time for joining us. Um, you continue to do wonderful things to help the city, to help um, the country, and to be great partners to us and help us know what we should do as we evolve um, what we think experience means. So thank you for you guys and for joining this panel. Thank you for having us here. Thanks for having us. Great, thank you, Jake. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Um, we are just about out of time. I would like to highlight our upcoming Healthy New York Summit on Thursday, another online virtual summit. That'll be uh, Thursday, September 17th from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Registration is free and on our website. Also, we have a virtual Brooklyn State Legislative Forum sponsored by AARP New York this coming Thursday on the 20th at 10 a.m. Registration is also free. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, very great conversations throughout the afternoon. And thank you to everyone who tuned in to listen. Also, thanks to our sponsors, SAP Qualtrics, Berkeley College, Google, NTT Data Services, UFT, Verbit, Council of School Supervisors and Administrators, Hapara, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, Monroe College, Overdrive, ICPH, and CDW. And finally, that concludes our program. Thank you.